Hello and welcome to Brass Tacks Talking Cybersecurity, brought to you by Fortinet. I'm your host, Joe Robertson, and cybersecurity is exactly what this show is about. But we don't talk technology, we talk about the business implications of cybersecurity for decision makers, executives, board members, in fact, anyone whose roles could be impacted by cyber attacks, which nowadays means just about everyone. As for me, I'm an executive consultant helping top managers navigate the intersection between business needs and security requirements. Now we call this program Brass Tax because the expression getting down to brass tax means getting to the core of a subject, the important points. So let's get down to brass tax. Today's guest is Michael Cole, Chief Technology Officer at the European Tour Group, which runs professional golf tournaments. Michael, welcome to Brass Tax. Let's talk cybersecurity. It's my pleasure to be here, Joe. Great. Now, I thought first we'd just say, what is the European Tour? Can you tell us about it and what your role is there? The European Tour Group is, is actually a professional golf organization. We put in place and stage three separate tours for our members, both the Le Challenge Tour, also the DP World Tour, and the Legends Tour. But we also run the European side of the Ryder Cup as well. Uh, now, yes. actually, between those three tours, um, they comprise over 100 professional golf tournaments around the world in over 40 different countries. We kind of call ourselves the, the global tour, in fact. And if you take our TV product, the TV product is actually distributed to over 160 countries. That's an addressable market of over 600 million households. That's amazing. So you've got a not just a, a golf tournament, but it's really all of the technology with televising that. That's, that's an amazing environment because I wouldn't have thought of golf as being a high-tech sport other than, I guess, the, the shafts and the balls. Maybe they're a little bit high-tech. But when you talk about all that technology, the, the television, the images, all that stuff, there's an awful lot behind that, isn't it? Yeah, and we've been on a huge technological transformation over the last few years. But let's just contextualize golf for, for a moment. We're not two teams. We have up to 156 players. We're not a single stadium. We have 18 fields of play. We don't play for 80 or 90 minutes like many other sports. We play for four days. So that throws up a lot of complication in terms of the technological underpinning. But the TV product as well, we have between 30 and 120 cameras across a course in any given time. So we are complicated. But I'll take it one stage further. Actually, it wasn't that long ago when this little device here that we all know as the smartphone was actually not permitted to be utilized in our tournaments. Of course, you wouldn't want it ringing uh, when the golfer is about to take a swing. Well, there were some concerns around uh, intellectual property, but, but equally not being a distraction for the professional golfers as well. Absolutely. But our mindset has now changed. Of course, we're still cognizant of those considerations, but actually we have what we call a mobile first approach. So how we engage with our stakeholders and give them the right information at the right time is all developed through technology. In fact, we have many apps. We have an app for our volunteers, we have an app for our players, we have an app for our health and safety, incident management, and of course, we have an app for the, the fans uh, around the world, but, but also on the course as well. So actually, we have gone through a huge technological change, but also a, a cultural change as well. A cultural change. Let's talk about that in a few minutes, because you said something there that I found very interesting. You've done this technology tr change, and it's become a, a digital first organization. In fact, it sounds to me like it's it really the golf course is, is a smart city, and you are moving that smart city around every week. Wouldn't that be right? You're absolutely right. We've gone from building small towns to smart cities, in fact. And that's because we no longer focus around just the connectivity and being a data-led organization. We're now very much about true insights and true intelligence. And it's really that smart city analogy that helps create multiple sources of, of intelligence. But, but equally, as you'd imagine, that has a slightly darker side as well. Because what we've done through that evolution, we've actually expanded our 
our threat landscape. Our vulnerability has increased immeasurably. So we set about a number of years ago to really focus in around our cyber protection and put it in place a route that was going to help maintain our tournaments and our key stakeholders as, it, as we evolve with that technological evolution. So putting in place cybersecurity, that sounds like a, a technology uh, solution, if you will. But uh, protecting a large organization that's moving around, that's about a lot more than just technology, isn't it? It's got to be about culture. And to give you the analogy here, I kind of break these things down into three areas, as I do with any aspect of technology. Because, let's face it, we can deploy technology overnight. That's layer one. The second layer is about the process. And, and that may take a little longer to, to kind of think through and to put in place and certainly to embed. But culture, number three, culture takes a lot longer. That's got to be deep into the organization. It's got to shift the mindset. And that's very much up to us what cybersecurity is about. It's about the adoption across the organization, change in behaviors, change in mindset, deep rooted into the culture of the organization. Well, that's something that doesn't change overnight, like you're saying. And it's the kind of thing that really needs to, to start at the top, if you will. How, how did you go about if you were getting the board on board for cybersecurity? Well, let's talk about actually building up from the bottom, just, just for a moment, and I'll come back to answer the question from the top. So the first thing that we said about is actually what was the key role that our staff were going to play in this? Now, I've heard some organizations and some security specialists talk about people and talk about staff as being the weakest link the point of vulnerability. Now, for me, that's not a great message. It's not really about empowering the, the staff members across our organization. So we wanted to reflect upon that and actually to expand upon that responsibility, we position it as the human firewall. We position that is the role that they yeah. undertake. So each and every one of our staff members actually is our first line of defense. They are the human firewall. They're not the weakest link. And then how do we tackle it from the top down? Well, again, these things can be quite challenging, particularly for technologists in any organization. But we have to put it into a language that is meaningful to the board, that is meaningful to the executive teams. And when we think about cyber terrorism, when we think about the threat, it can impact any organization in three areas. Reputation is critical. Financial impact is the second, but, but also around staff, staff morale, st staff motivation. And, and when you break cyber protection and cyber security into those three subject matters, of, of staff, of financial protection, of reputational mitigation. Those are three key topics of any board, of any leadership team. So changing the narrative and putting the context into a, into a discussion and into a language that they truly resonated with help us generate this is a, is a board level discussion and then driving it from the top. So those were the two aspects really that we deployed through through the, the campaigns that we've been running and our kind of principle of, of mindset that we have when we're thinking about cyber protection across the organization. When you were developing all of the new applications that you were talking about on the smartphone there, you had to build cybersecurity into it. Was that something that you felt like uh, and I, I've talked to other uh, executives who in charge of security, who, and I want to know if this happened with you, that they felt like they were lone wolves saying, we've got to have security in the applications versus let's get the application out as fast as possible. There's always that tension between speed and, and security. Were you facing that kind of a dilemma within the organization? Uh, yeah. I'd be lying if I say we weren't. I mean, those are always key considerations. And, and often when we look at 
big developments or even minor developments, you know, when you change the mindset, what we want is is for our organization, whether they are the business leaders or whether they are the technical developers, always to be thinking security. And when you get to that point, that's when you know you've changed the mindset. It shouldn't be an afterthought. It should be the forethought. And, and therefore, if you get that thinking from day one, actually the evolution development becomes that much, not simpler, but actually you know you're addressing all aspects of that development in one hit rather than perhaps retrospectively applying technology once a product or once a development is, is, is created. Yeah, that's always much more difficult. That would be at the level of the technology groups, the developers, etc. But you were talking about the, the staff in general, and that involves lots of people who don't do development of applications, and they're, they're on the television teams, they're on the, the, the technical teams for producing the product that, that you have. A lot of companies are faced with the same situation that, that you have, which is we're transforming into a digital organization. It doesn't matter what we do what our product is. Your product is golf. It could be widgets, whatever it is, but we need to have this technical infrastructure. And you were saying that the staff is your human firewall. How do you get the staff to feel like they have ownership of the cybersecurity as much as the technical people do? Well, again, we probably have a greater challenge in a lot of, of organizations because one thing I mentioned earlier on, we're staging 100 tournaments throughout the, the, the calendar year, which actually means we don't have a lot of downtime. In fact, whereas many other sports have a down season of three to four months, I think we have three days in November. We go from one season to the next. So it's critical that we get the timing right. And we did exactly that. Earlier on this year, we took a month and, and we created a campaign for the entire month. We, we had mandatory training in place because we felt this was so important, but we made it engaging. We put some fun around that. We, we created almost a competitive environment. We had quizzes, we had prizes to give away, but we also wanted to make it quite personal to the individual teams. And so we ran individual workshops with those respective teams because what's really critical is we're not missing a trick. We're turning over every stone, looking at every particular vulnerability, Myself as a CGO, I don't know the way that every single team across your organization operates. And so we wanted to make it personal to get a deeper understanding on how those teams operate, how they interact with their counterparts across the organization. So running workshops, running quizzes, running mandatory training, and really just make it uh, an engaging campaign. And it really did pay dividends. I can tell you now that actually the results that we got from that cybersecurity campaign over a given month was the highest level of completion we've had for any mand mandatory training that we've run across the organization. Well, that's impressive because I know that in most organizations, when they say, we've got mandatory training, it's not something that gets people all excited. For this training set, did you have a lot of engagement from the top, from the leadership? Because that often has an impact on how well things are followed by uh, by the, the rest of the staff. Yes, we did. And, and that was critical. And, and I mentioned that actually how, by putting it into a language it they understand, enabled that facilitation from the top down. Running that campaign approach from the bottom up and empowering our staff is that first line of defense. That also helped. But there's probably a third element to this as well, innovation. Now, how do, well, how do you mean innovation? <laughs> well, it was, not just training innovation, I assume. Well, well, also, I guess there are many people that they always consider innovation to be stifled through security. It's always the IT department. It's always the security department. It kind of says, I'm sorry, you can't do that. There's a security risk. There's a vulnerability. Actually, what we've done is to turn that perception around. I can give you a great example, actually, of how we have a team operating remotely in New Zealand. They are responsible for some of the TV graphics. And through our cybersecurity that we put in place, we have global VPNs. We have actually enabled them to undertake their critical role for our TV product in real time from the other side of the planet. Now, that has been enabled through our security posture, through our security uh, rapid we have in protecting our organization because we've given them the facility to work that way. 
you could argue that actually our security strategy is now driving our innovation across our organization. Again, another change in mindset of any organization. Being a digitally led organization, becoming a security led organization, that's pretty impressive right there. And these people in New Zealand, they're operating on all of the different uh, tournaments wherever they are in the world? Absolutely. Now, they are, are able to get significant work-life balance back um, as a result. Um, <laughs> that sounds like they're going to be working at night sometimes, though. <laughs> I, I think they're prepared to make that compromise. But, Rather but than equally, traveling around the world. But, but, but equally on that point, it's more cost-effective for us as an organization to have them work in that way. And let's be serious, it's the right thing to do for the planet as well. So equally, not only is it driving innovation, but it's also a key element of our sustainability strategy too. So cybersecurity is actually something that's helping your innovation. Uh, Michael, we, we don't have a lot of time left, so I'd like to kind of boil it down to, to one question, which is when you deal with executives, board members, and you are talking with them about cybersecurity, if there were one thing you would like them to understand and really have in their, their souls, if you will, what would it be? Well, Joe, I'm going to bend the rules a little bit here. I'm going to come back with three key messages for me. Okay, okay, three. I'll let you. I'll grant you that. Well, first of all, security is not about the technology, as we have covered in depth. It's about the culture. Secondly, it's a responsibility of everybody across the organisation, but it's important that the staff really understand their role they play in that protection of the organization. They're not the weakest link. They are critical. They are our first line of defense. They are the human firewall. And then thirdly, organizations need to think about security, not as a, a blocker of innovation, but actually how it becomes an enabler, not only of innovation, but also of a sustainability strategy for the organization too. Very interesting words. Well, thank you very much, Michael Cole. It's been a real pleasure talking to you, and I wish you the best of luck driving even more innovation into the European tour. It's been a pleasure, Joe. Well, that's it for today's Brass Tax with Michael Cole, Chief Technology Officer at the European Tour Group. I hope you found it interesting and useful. Please join us again for another episode of Brass Tax Talking Cybersecurity, brought to you by Fortinet. This series is available both as an audio and a video podcast. You will find it on your regular podcast app or YouTube, as well as on Fortinet TV.